So let's get started. Last presentation of the day. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, I will be talking about uh, not as technical as the previous uh, presentation, going into spin locks and SMP and so on, yeah. But there are like a few interesting uh, things that I will be showing. So it's not only, a, you know, general graphs, etc. It's going to go a little bit technical, yeah. Uh, basically, we have been collecting data and, and tracking data in, in, in Zephyr for a while, actually since the project has started. I mean, that, that, you know, when it was started eight, eight years ago, yeah, the first thing we would start, you know, counting, looking at commits and looking how, how many boards were added last month, started with eight, or like a handful, actually, a handful of, 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 of boards. There were, obviously, we also had a few drivers, and that started growing as well. So these are like the type of things we were tracking. And that uh, was mostly you know, to, to, to see if we are like healthy, if, we are, if things are going well. And uh, <clears throat> eight years later, which is basically this year or today, we, we, we basically established like constant growth in all of these areas, like commits, like number of boards, like drivers, hardware's, hardware supported and, uh, or architecture supported and so on. And uh, recently, or in, in the last few years, we started also tracking all kinds of things that go beyond the obvious uh, metrics, like commits and number of pods. We, we, we started looking at things like, uh, you know, uh, metrics that are related to uh, project health, performance metrics, KPIs, key performance indicators, um, talking about performance here, footprint, and so on. And other metrics that, uh, in many ways, keep us honest toward our community, yeah? Trying to track, like, you know, how long it takes for something to get merged, the, the review times, how, how, how long does it take for an issue, you know, to, to get resolved, and so on. So all kinds of things that help us uh, also improve, uh, you know, the, 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 our performance, as an open source project, but also uh, keeping like to the promise with which the project has started, which included something like you know constrained devices and minimal footprint and and running on different architectures and so on. So when tracking metrics and and you know I mean we, you can go really wild in the things that you can show and. And display so you can go, you know, about issues, about how many forks and how many stars you have on GitHub, how many downloads. Although I mean, downloads doesn't really apply in our case. Um, the documentation and how it evolves, you know, how many organizations or users are using Zephyr, number of contributors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? I mean, there are so many metrics and so many, so many key items that you would use to, to, to track an open source project and see if you are healthy. I, I will focus a little bit on the technical side, not on the social side of, um, side of things. Uh, and I will be showing, a, have a few uh, use cases or uh, a few things that we are tracking, show basically how uh, we have been doing over time and also, you know, how we are using this data and how we, how we are reacting to this data. So the things that over time we have identified is that obviously there is constant growth. I talked about that in, in the community, of the community. Uh, the code base itself and hardware support and also the use cases of Zephyr in terms of like where it is being used. Uh, the, the different features that it supports and so on. We also, using some of the metrics that I will be showing, you will, you will also see that uh, it is, you know, easy to say that, or I mean, it is fair to say that we have a stable core of the OS. There are a lot of fluctuations here and there, but things that are manageable and things are, that are usually expected and 
it's not always going in the negative side. We actually have very good improvements over time. Uh, I will show a few of them. Some of them would be familiar because they they would correlate like to key events in the in the tree. And it's very easy to identify and see and understand also why these things are happening. So it's, I mean, metrics are not always there to show you that you are doing something wrong. They actually show you sometimes that, hey, you are on the good path and you are doing something, something right. So let's start with a few case studies and a few, a few, a few examples of things that we have been, uh, uh, of data that we have been tracking. So the first one is a little bit social, but it, it's, a, it's a very, uh, very, uh, you know, uh, uh, important metric in my opinion, and something that, depending where you are looking, uh, it's, it, you, you get different numbers, right? I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a matter of definition at the end of the day. So if you look like, for example, on GitHub, yeah, you will see that we have like 2,000, I mean, that's what, like one of the numbers you will see, 2,039 uh, contributors, according to GitHub. And that number basically means that since the project was started on based on the code base and how many commits you have there and who have committed, who has committed, we have two, over 2,000 uh, contributors. Obviously, that does not mean that at any given time we have 2,000 contributors, but over the, the life of the project, 2000, over 2,000 people actually worked on the project, contributed in one way or another. In this case, it's, it's going to be a commit. Somebody committed something. If you look at Git, it's a little bit more because the project goes actually beyond GitHub and before GitHub, and there are probably a lot of commits in the tree uh, for users who actually don't have an account on GitHub or or, you know, there is now, I mean, GitHub can't find who that is, et cetera. So it's a little bit more, yeah. And uh, as, I, I mean, if you attended my session last year, and some of you probably did, I mean, the, the history of our project goes beyond or before it was posted to GitHub. A few years before and maybe more years before it actually was planned to go uh, uh, and become Zephyr. So this is, this is according to GitHub. If you look at the Linux Foundation, I have actually all the links for some of these dashboards and, and, and areas also linked at the end. We, there is a, a dashboard like with a lot of metrics from the Linux Foundation that tracks various projects uh, uh, managed by the Linux Foundation. And Zephyr is one of them. And there, basically, the number of contributors is, is uh, tracked as over 6,000. And that's due to the fact that uh, contributors are considered anybody who has does, you know, touched or did anything on, on, on GitHub. So you can actually be submitting an issue or, you know, editing a wiki probably or doing whatever. You are considered a contributor, which is fair, right? I mean, it, that's where, like, contributors sometimes uh, the terminology is a little bit confusing, yeah? So I, I, I think that contributor, anybody, you don't have to be committing code. You might actually be just participating in meetings and discussions, and you are a contributor. That's, that's, that's great. So it's not always about code. So this is just shows like the numbers. And something interesting that you can extract from Git and, and other sources is also like trying to see the, 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 gro the growth over time. So here, basically looking at how many contributors uh, are active each month since the project has started. So obviously that does not show the 2,000 number. This is, I mean, if you look at a bare month basis, we, we first we have growth in, or constant growth, which is really great. And if you look at like the last month, we have at like in the last month over 200 people active working on the project. Which is, which is also a good number. And that actually correlates and uh, it corresponds also to the number of commits going into the tree. So it's, it's, it's nice to see that these two uh, graphs actually align. Which, I mean, then you'll start thinking, who are these 200 people? And are they, you know, is that the same number of people 
going, you know, and, and just more people are, are joining the, the same number or, or a core team or how or does that change in a, in a dramatic way over time, etc. And that's, that's where I, I wanted to look and see and understand because it, it's very important that when, when you run a project like that to see, you know, what, what's happening, who, who's actually running the project and who's loyal to the project and who sticks around, right? So if you look at, at this graph, you will see, for example, that, you know, we have like almost 100 contributors who worked more, uh, more uh, two or, or more years on the project. We have like 50 of them who have been working on a project more than three years. So, and the blue, the blue uh, section here is, which is the majority, of contributors are people who actually worked more less than a year on the project. So that shows, shows that there are a lot of, there's a core, you know, contributor uh, uh, block and there are a lot of people who come and go all the time. And that actually can also see, be seen in, in terms of commits. So basically we see that, you know, we have the majority like 1,800 or something like that with one to 10 commits. And then a very small number, like with with commits that go into the thousands, and and probably I mean if you look around, I mean s s some of the top you know committers in the project, you, you would find them in this conference usually, yeah, because they they have been there for a while and they are very involved and so on, yeah. So basically, it shows that. Uh, the way the project is, is done, I mean, we, we, we always have new faces, we always have new contributors, new, also new ideas, and new code coming in. Uh, and it's not like the same core dictating or managing the project in a way that uh, is, is, uh, is, is, is not subject to change and, and so on. So there are new faces, new ideas all the time, which is, which is really great. Uh, with that, I will jump to something else, which I mean, many of you probably haven't seen before, because although it, it was available or we have been looking at and working on for a while, it, it, it was not public in terms of like it was not published for, for everyone to see. Uh, and that's uh, performance tracking. In this case, over one year. That's something we did like a little bit retroactively. This is now available. I will, I will show the link later. This, you know, I mean, obviously you need to do, you need to understand what that is. This, we have a test or a benchmark in the Zephyr tree called latency measure, which does actually go and, and, uh, and test like uh, key metrics, like context switching, semaphore taking and giving, with mutex, heap, memory allocation, and so on and so on. And there are also different variants of this benchmark. So this one I'm showing here is like the most basic uh, configuration. You can enable user space, then you can see also, uh, you know, numbers with regard to, you know, context switching between user and, and kernel threads and so on, yeah. And obviously, immediately, you will notice that there are like big jumps in the graph there. In this case, these numbers are going down, yeah, which is, which is uh, you know, not bad, yeah. But you also see a lot, of, a lot of things happening there as well. Okay, for example, this is actually very recent, uh, early March. And I saw that and said, oh, okay, that's, you know, suspicious. What's going on here? And... One thing that you can do here is go and bisect and see what happened here. Is it justified? Is it my script? And so on. And I bisected that, and that's a commit that introduced that. That was me, yeah? So <laughs> I was not happy about that. And I had to go and look and see what exactly happened there. And if you look at the commit message, this was, this was no uh, functional change. I was just moving things around trying to clean up the, the, the tree. Uh, and, you know, talking with, with Peter, one of the kernel maintainers, and looking also at, at the change itself, at the comet, I immediately noticed that, I mean, okay, I moved 
I mean, we, we had a lot of functions, a lot of functionality, or a lot of the implementation in one single file in the kernel. This is the scheduler. And a lot of things were, I mean, basically declared static in line. And when you start moving things around, I mean, you would assume the compiler would take care of everything, etc., but that's not the case. That, by the way, the, the, the bump or the change is actually very minimal. We are talking about 500 nanoseconds or something like that. And by the way, this is using chemo. Yeah, so this is using chemo. I'm not even trying to use hardware here. And we, we established, or by, by running the data on all the emulators, some emulators are a little bit, you know, they go up and down in a crazy way. But some of them are actually really stable, chemo and other simulators. And I'm not interested in saying here, or seeing like speeds or like, trying to meet a criteria or like uh, certain numbers. I just want these simulators to be stable. So if I run them on a code from one year ago, and um, I mean, and, and, and now, I, I should see basically the same, the same trends and not things going up and down like crazy. And that some of, this is like a risk five chemo, I think. Uh, and you can see there. And by the way, so I, I actually went and move things around a little, put like some of the functions, which are utility functions, in, in, in a header, move the, and submit a pull request. Interestingly, my fix for this problem improved the performance uh, uh, and, and brought the numbers or uh, ma made it better than before this commit. So something actually at, at the end, a net gain of 500 nanoseconds after the the, the fix here, which is which is really great. So this is this is one. There are uh, this is this is also part of the dashboard. We are using Elasticsearch, and this shows you the difference uh, that we have uh, basically from. I did it like on a weekly basis, so from week to week, like every week since last year, I would go and run the benchmarks. And uh, you will see, like, this shows the difference from the last value. So it would immediately show you, for example, uh, where certain changes have happened. And over the last year, you will see that uh, there are fluctuations, but th these are, like, very many. We are talking about a few nanoseconds here and there. This is, like, you know, you add, like, one line of code, probably, in some function in the kernel, you know, to fix a bug or to improve something, and, and that would show up here. Yeah, this is how sensitive it is. Uh, however, we also noticed like major, major uh, changes there. This one can be contributed to this guy here. Yeah, this is the drop, which is actually a positive thing. This is when we move to Bicolipsy. Yeah, and this is the memory allocation. I think the heap, something I, I don't remember right now, but this actually is one of them. And if you remember, we also had this, we have seen the same thing in the footprint. Yeah, I, I will be showing them. But this is like one of the uh, things that came out of the B uh, uh, making B C uh, de the default. Yeah. Uh, and there is a few others that I will be talking about as well. So here, that's basically one of the tests that we have. Don't try, it's the kernel abort kernel from kernel. And you will see that there are, this is like a step function. One, one change happened in uh, November, and the other one was in early March. I bisected, the first change was introduced by Peter Mitzis, one of the kernel maintainers. And I looked at the change, I mean, this, is, this was like really a functional change, a bug fix, mostly. I mean, adding and moving things around. So I, I, a change in the, in the metric would have been expected. Uh, and I don't see that as a regression in this case. Yeah, I mean, looking at like all of the code that was added, you know, the branching, the conditionals, etc., that is something that is really expected. Uh, the other one is actually the same commit that I was talking about earlier. Yeah. So actually with my fix, this actually will, will go a little bit down as well. So, I mean, the net uh, change there is, is, is something minimal and acceptable. Yeah. 
Now going back to this is this is performance, and I'm just showing like one aspect of that. If you go at look at footprint, which we have been tracking actually for longer, and uh, it's also public and and, and available on stats.zephyrproject.org. Something that we want to move to 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 the same infrastructure we have we use right now using Elasticsearch and and Kibana, and and you will see actually it's over time. And by the way, this is on freedom board like one of our earliest boards that we have in the tree we have a few applications like here the footprints this is a footprint application and here it's using user space so different configuration to see basically what's going on and over the years since like almost two years it's actually not bad it's going down like on a constant basis yeah and a major drop happened when we introduced picolipsy as well yeah so it, it, it has major impact on the on the fo footprint in a, in a positive way uh, but we keep seeing uh, like drops when, whenever we optimize or, or overhaul the code and so on so it is it is definitely going in the right direction this is not an exact science after all I mean sometimes you know a k config is dropped sometimes you might be actually dropping like one feature here and there so it's not always the code being optimized the same code sometimes things go away but at least this will give you a trend and uh, the way it is done so it's not like just like an image number it actually goes by by the you know by the components that you have in the in the binary so you have the kernel you have you know the uh, the subsystems and so on actually and, and now we are looking into go, going deeper because some of the subsystems like Bluetooth or networking are so big and the, the maintainers of these areas want to see uh, want to zoom in basically and look at uh, their own subsystems so they can optimize at the subsystem level so we are working on adding additional layers so people can see exactly where for example in the Bluetooth stack they can improve or, or how they can track the, the, uh, the footprint there. Another one, basically also uh, related uh, coming from the footprint, this is without user space. And the drop at the end there, I think that was last year in August or something like that, that's also related to the BQLIP C change. Yeah? If I see that correctly, yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is like, footprint and uh, and performance so all of this is is available online it's actually being tracked and and and, and updated on a daily basis the, the the benchmarks it's it is online and uh, I, I need just to submit like this we need to submit the ci uh, change to to start tracking that on on, on constant basis and now this, this is all great and 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 it is you know uh, very useful however uh, there are other things I'm trying to move to the next slide did I freeze or what Okay, so beside the social stuff and number of commits and contributors and the performance and, 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 and footprint and so on, we also try to track things that relate to our day-to-day -day work and operation of the project. And one thing that we started late last year, earlier this year, is, is, is tracking like the merge criteria, making sure that we keep, I mean, we, we, we keep ourselves honest toward the community and toward, you know, our, our colleagues in the project and, and, and try to, 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 to be consistent in how, uh, you know, uh, pull requests and, and, change, uh, and changes are, are processed and dealt with. So this is something like part of our guidelines and, and documentation is that we have, uh, 
some criteria defined for, for merging upon request. So for example, needs to have a minimal of two approvals, including an approval by the designated assignee. That means that the maintainer of the area that is being changed. We have the 4i principle on the organization, organization level. That means if, you, if the submitter, the reviewers, the assignee are from the same company or organization, the merger needs to be from a different organization. Yeah? And that's just to make sure that you know, things are played in a fair way and things are not rushed uh, into into the tree uh, to to you know uh, by you know one organization, and then a minimum review of period of two business days, four hours for trivial changes, and hard fixes can always be met. So I mean, this is something that at least most of these things can be tracked and 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 can be accounted for using scripting and so on. The, the four eyes principle. This is something that we are still working on, so we are monitoring that manually. But based on this criteria, we actually provided some, uh, this here provided by, by Fabio uh, from Google. It's like a merge list to make it easy uh, for people who have the merge rights to actually go and look at what is ready to be merged. And that actually has been working really well. Almost we have been using that for two, three months and it had helped a lot with how we deal with pull requests and how we merge things. And uh, that's, I mean, we got a lot of feedback last year in the developer survey and also in the, in, in the uh, conference ZDS in, 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 in Prague. And since then, I mean, we, we really got a lot of, uh, we made a lot of progress and a lot of people are happy with how is it working. I mean, just to show you an example, this is, this is a, a dashboard we created to, to track basically also any, any pull request that is merged, basically tracking who merged that, who was the submitter, and so on. And it, is, it has helped us identifying trends and, uh, uh, you know, and with the, w w when you start using also the, the merge queue or the merge list, it, 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 everything is transparent, people can see exactly what's happening over time and who uh, is, you know, uh, leading the charts in terms of merges and uh, who is leading the charts in terms of submitting uh, pull requests and so on. So it gives us like an idea and, and, and see exactly how is it, things are going, but it also shows us if we are violating our own rules. And this is the example here. So we have like two pie charts, and this is, I think, over uh, uh, the first one is like 2003. It shows you like assignee approved, no is almost 15%, uh, which is not really great because that means we have merged something that was not approved by a certain assignee. It's not always bad because sometimes you have, there are exceptions, but 15%, that's way too much. That means we are doing something wrong. Either things are being assigned to the wrong people or assignees or maintainers are not being responsive and so on and so on. The other pie chart is showing, uh, you know, pull requests that have been, been, been merged with, uh, with in, giving enough time, uh, uh, you know, for people to review. 60%, yes. and no, almost 40%. That's, so that's not really great because that means we are rushing things in, sometimes not giving people enough time to review. Yeah. So this is 2023. Yeah. If you look at 2024, and we started like, I think in, in, in February to start enforce and getting people getting accustomed to the dashboards and then your script and, and the merge list, that number actually went down. Yeah. So uh, at least for the assignee approved, you will see that NA means there was no need for this or there was no assignee because this, may, may, this area doesn't have a maintainer and so on. Yeah? But the number uh, in red here, that, that's basically a, a major improvement from 2023. Similar thing with uh, the review time. So that means that we went down from almost 40% to 10%, which is really great. That means we have enough time, uh, we, we given people uh, enough time for, to review things. 
if you look at like just last month, that's even better, right? So we have we we have been like really doing well uh, on on both fronts, and uh, I would assume like or even like this, you know, the things that did not go uh, or or did not follow the the criteria probably were just exceptions for whatever reason. I mean, our scripts, after all, are not that perfect, and sometimes you have the wrong label or the wrong assignee and, and stuff like that. So we have been doing really well. Just going, I mean, on other dashboards and other data that we use is like we have the code coverage, something that we run also on a constant basis. basis. Every time we push the tree, I mean, using at least the tools that we have and the capabilities that we have, we are able to extract coverage information uh, for basic functionality, yeah? so it's not every feature that we have in the tree, anything that we can run in CI. We have our own dashboards for tracking bugs and, and issues and something that we use on a, on a daily basis, basically, or on a weekly basis when we do the triaging, so on, how many high priority, medium priority bugs and so on. And we also have static coding analysis uh, uh, charts and, and, and data that comes from Coverty in, in this case and does not really, it's not something that we produce, but we at least we do the scanning, submit to Coverity, at least the, the open source uh, uh, side of Coverity. And we get like, because we have been doing that for a while, we can get like some data about, you know, the, the type of issues that is, are found in Coverity and so on. So that's, that's really great as well. So there are many, many places where we uh, actually can collect data. But that's not great because this is like all over the place and we, we are trying basically to consolidate and gather all the data in one dashboard or one, one, one place. Ideally, this would be Kibana Zephyr Project.io, which is, which is our Elasticsearch uh, uh, instance. Uh, we want also to, to, to try and create a feedback loop so that like if there are anomalies and if there are major drops in performance, or even if there are positive drop, uh, positive, uh, how do you call it, improvements, yeah, uh, then we, we want to know this. We, it shouldn't be that, you know, somebody is, uh, should be watching these things. So we need to figure out how to get notified when something happens so we can, uh, you know, respond immediately. Uh, we want also to identify issues as early as possible. So right now we do it on the, on the tree, on the checked, on the checked in code. We want to have certain checks run on pull requests. So if somebody increases the footprint, they should know about it. Or if, if their change decreases the performance of the kernel, context switching or other metrics and so on, we, they need to see that so that we don't merge the code and, and fix it later. We, we can react, it, uh, react to it as soon as possible. And we want to obviously to add more metrics using hardware because a lot of the things that we have depend like on simulators and stuff like that. And it's very important that we also see how things work in real life. So we are looking like uh, at using, uh, for example, tracking timer accuracy using uh, also uh, like uh, logic analyzers and other external tooling. Uh, we want to go further and look at various subsystems, whether it's uh, peripherals, whether it's networking, Bluetooth, and so on. Yeah? So uh, we definitely want to increase that and have, try to have everything in one place, which would definitely uh, improve the overall quality uh, of the project. So key takeaways here is that tracking helps with enforcement of project principles and guidelines. Yeah, this is like in terms of footprint, in terms of the merge time, and so on and so on. Yeah, visualization of project activity provides an early and transparent alarm system available to all stakeholders. This is this is it is key. I mean, a lot of these charts sometimes you you create them, you look at at them yourself. Uh, it's it's fun and so on. But I think that the most important thing is whatever we do here is available to everyone exactly the same way and exactly uh, uh, using the same infrastructure so that uh, more people can first contribute with additional metrics, but also so we, we can have people analyze and look at the data and, and come up with solution 
whether it's technical uh, metrics or even like things that are related to how the project operates. Yeah. These are the, the resources of GitHub Insights. All of you are familiar with that, LFX Insights. It's insightslfx.linuxfoundation.org. And I will actually show that briefly because it's actually really nice. I hope I can do that in the last few minutes. So here, this is, okay, so this is, and it's, oh, okay, I can look here, it's good. <laughs> uh, let me start with this. So this is the metric stuff. As you can see, you can select the platform that you want to choose. Some of them are really flaky in terms of, you can have multiple platforms, then it looks really weird, yeah, because they are on a completely different scale, yeah. So usually you would actually want to go and select one. And uh, you can, this is the difference here. And you can go and, and look at the, at the metrics one by one here, yeah? So that's something that you, you definitely need to go drill down and play with the numbers and so on. But I think this guy here helps a lot identify when major changes have happened. And you can actually also select which metric you want to show. So here like, oh, I'm interested in FIFO get blocking kernel to kernel. You can, you can do that and you can see exactly what's going on here. So this is one. Uh, this is the dashboard that we use to show that, to track the, the, the merge criteria. This is like the last 30 days. Shows you exactly who's active, who's, who's merging, who's submitting, um, top submitters, top reviewers. And you can actually go and, you know, and select also like, a name, in this case here, myself, and see basically what this guy is going and who's merging their pull request and so on. It, it is really provides some transparency on how we are dealing with uh, our community and code changes. So that's that. This one just shows like the bugs, high priority, medium priority, etc. goes back to 2019. Uh, no surprises here. I mean, the numbers go up and then go down. I mean, this is when we triage them probably and it's, it's like a constant curve, if you want, yeah. This one is the footprint. You can go in and select which application. So we have a lot of Bluetooth application here. We also have a lot of example platforms because different architectures behave differently. You can also, beside Flash, you can also look at RAM. So RAM actually doesn't change much. This is like stack and, and stuff like this. So it's... it's uh, Steady. A lot of the changes usually and fluctuations happen on the on the footprint side. Eh, sorry, on the on the flash side. Here, this is coverity. Yeah, uh, but that one LFX insights. That's actually really interesting because you have to be careful when you look at the data and 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 read exactly what each matrix means. And that's actually very well explained in the in the pop up here. But it actually goes into a lot of a lot of things related to open source projects. So it goes into issues, pull requests, forks, stars, etc. And it's really nice sometimes to see where are you standing and if you are doing well and so on, or if your company is contributing enough and so on. Yeah. So that's really great resource as well. Take a look at that and yeah, play with this. There's there's a lot of a lot of data. Yeah. With this, thank you everyone. And if you have any questions. I'll be happy to answer them. Wow, right on time. That's good. Yeah, I've tried to uh, uh, go to this uh, provided links like stats Zephyr project dot org and uh, Kibana Zephyr projects dot io. And uh, in my case, uh, I don't see anything statistic. Like in case of Grafana, it's just a graf default Grafana page without anything. In case of Kibana, I try to go as an uh, unlocked user. And uh, again, I see no data at all. Do I need to be in some specific group? Uh, no, no, it should be anonymous. I, I can, we can take a look at that after that. Maybe it doesn't work on your mobile or something like that. But yeah, it could figure be, it but... out. Yeah. Okay. They are anonymous, yeah, so it should be fine. If I develop applications or drivers out of three, 
Um, would it be possible to replicate some of these dashboards uh, specifically around code health um, locally or, you know, in an environment? Um, yeah, so for example, the benchmark stuff is something that you can run in the tree on any board, on any driver, on any hardware. Yeah, so it's actually, this is code that is available in the tree. Same thing with the footprint analysis. All of this data is based on scripts and tools that we have in the tree already. We just collect it in a certain way and push it, you know, to, to this. Obviously, you know, if you want to visualize and so on, you, you can do that also using Excel or whatever, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, you don't need to use these tools. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You didn't mention about test results, about uh, tests can, that can be uh, executed on uh, board farms. Uh, are there any plans to make this public? Or? Well, I mean, the data is there. Yeah. So, I mean, if you go there, but uh, that's like a testing, uh, where is it here? That's, uh, I didn't look there for, uh, for a while. So excuse me if that, no, actually it's, it's working well. Yeah, so last seven days. So if anything that we push into Zephyr when we run the test, we actually publish the, the results, all of the chemo results and so on. Yeah. So all of that is, 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 is also being published. It's also public. We want, as you mentioned, to actually establish something like this also, like for hardware farms, so like different users and vendors can push the actual results of tests running uh, on their hardware into one common place. And that's, that's something that is in the works right now. Right now, all of the data that you see here, which you can access anonymously, is, is uh, based on chemo. Yeah? And that just gives us an idea of, you know, how many bushes and how many architectures and how many platforms, and how many tests, with, which areas are covered most. We will see here like the, the kernel libraries, logging, etc. But you will also see that certain areas are not really covered. And I'm talking here about running tests that are actually run and not just built like on, on, on platforms. So a lot of coverage we are getting using native POSIX and chemo. Uh, and a lot of features that are not testable in, in emulators will not show up here. Yeah, and, and that's that's really bad. And hopefully, this will change in the future once we start running on hardware. Yeah. So what I'd like to see a little bit more like statistical porn, uh, specifically about, for example, tests which you run in uh, upstream CI to see how we are uh, first growing number of tests which we execute and maybe different configurations because for me it's interesting how it could be sold to, to somebody saying okay so you may you may measure coverage in different ways but if we are growing the amount of tests and we are uh, growing the amount of platforms and architectures so then you also see uh, what amount of uh, background work is being done actually so for each pr how many uh, things you check yeah. and test and everything so uh, that is one thing uh, yeah that, no, that's exactly what you see here yeah i mean like 2600 test suites 20000 test cases you know platforms 1000 you know 1000 by the way this is because of the hardware model v2 because now we have like old platforms that have new names and in the database they appear a new name. Okay, so this is... <laughs> so can you plot, uh, plot these platforms uh, on a graph to see how it evolves with time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I mean, there are different ways to display this. By the way, here, so for example, you see like uh, which platforms are, are executing most of the tests. And Native Simulator right now is leading the pack, yeah? Chemo x86 as well, because that's where we do like user space testing. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, that that's, does not appear here, but uh, uh, there are, I mean, it would be really great, like if we can also, for example, from Synopsis, we could run Incent somewhere, right? I mean, we, 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 we do that. I have access to that. I, could, I mean, there is ways to start publishing this data here as well, because it's, it, in the, by the way, in the, in the other, in the performance, we ha I had Insim as well, yeah, so that's, which I liked really much because it's very predictable, very deterministic, yeah, which it, you can use as a, as a, as a reference, but I didn't choose to use it because it changed names, you know, in the last month, so that would 
skew the, the graphs. Anyways, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? There may be last question. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, great to see the basically the compliance with our policies on the merge policies. Um, but what was the impact overall to like merge times? In terms of mm. yeah, so yeah, like uh, what what's happening with our just overall PR merge times? Like, oh, is that, is that, I mean, that, that, I, I mean, know that's something that uh, uh, ben Benjamin's been tracking as well. So yeah, yeah, I mean, the the it's not it's not like we are deteriorating or it's becoming worse. We are. We, I mean, I think it it was really bad that we were merging too fast. Yeah, mm -hmm. and right now there is. Uh, at least a checkpoint or like a way to see okay this PR is ready to be merged because it was it had it went or it had it was reviewed enough based on our criteria it was reviewed by the right people there's the assignee has approved etc and you ha you see it in one place so there is no doubt that hey I can merge it or not sometimes because people didn't just want to start calculating times and, and so on, or, or they were nervous about merging something. Now we have something that would that give us like some assurance that, hey, this is good to go. That doesn't mean that you just go and click and merge it. Sometimes you have to go as a, as a, as a, as a release engineer and spend some time and figure out, okay, maybe I need to add another reviewer. Maybe I can't merge it because I am in the same organization and so on. But in general, we are around around these like two days, three days for pull requests that are ready to be merged, which is which is really great. Yeah. Last question. Thanks. So you mentioned about like showing these benchmarks and uh, that. So I often realize that there is a case that people ask you to like let's uh, create me some dashboard because it'd be super interesting, but then in the end, no one is looking at it. And I think that's what you mentioned, like with this benchmark, that you are looking at it and trying to identify the peaks and when it happened. And you also mentioned that um, you are looking in the ways how to automatize it and basically doing some kind of alerting system. Do, can you give uh, some insight into it? Not yet. That's uh, something that we want to have. I still don't didn't look in any uh, in a way how to do it. This could be used like these systems, like Elasticsearch or Kibana, but it can also be do, done in different ways uh, outside. We, we need to see how, how how it can be done. Yeah, I, I don't have a solution. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>